Welcome everyone to the Women of Color Advancing Peace and Securities FSO 101 series. I am Maritza Adonis and I have the honor of serving as the Global Advocacy and Diplomacy Working Group's founding chair. If this is your first time joining us, the Global Advocacy and Diplomacy Working Group was started about a year and a half ago to provide women of color pursuing a career in national security with the ecosystem and the knowledge, tools, and resources in order to specialize in fields, specifically in diplomatic sphere and in advocacy. Since this year so far, we have kicked off this amazing series where essentially what we do is, you know, we equip all of you with the knowledge, tools, and skills that you need in order to enter the American Foreign Service. So we heard your needs from earlier this year regarding wanting to hear more from women of color about their experiences, about the processes that they took in order to enter into the service. And so today we have three distinguished diplomats, Diplomat Hardaway, Diplomat Lewis, and Diplomat Escarne, who will be sharing their insights and their journey as a foreign service officer, specifically looking at the management and economic cones. First, I'd like to introduce you to Diplomat Christina Hardaway. Diplomat Hardaway has been a member of the U.S. Foreign Service for 10 years. She currently serves as the Deputy Chief of the Political Economic Section at the U.S. Embassy in Cameroon. In this role, she leads embassies' commercial, economic, and environmental portfolios. Diplomat Hardaway has served in the Bureau of African Affairs as a Cameroon desk officer, acting as liaison on U.S. Cameroon bilateral issues. Prior to that, Diplomat Hardaway worked with the U.S. African Development Foundation, also known as USADE, as a liaison between the State Department and USADE. She served as Gender, Health, and Entrepreneurship Officer for the Africa Bureau, coordinating the Bureau's policy programs in the areas of gender, health, and security. This includes liaising across the US government on programs such as Africa Women's Entrepreneurship Program, managing the Africa Women Peace and Security Program, and leading communications on the Bureau's responses to health crises in Africa, such as the Ebola crisis. So Matt Hardaway also had a special role in integrating gender into broader economic and security policy and programs in Africa. Prior to serving in the Africa Bureau, Diplomat Hardaway served at the U.S. Embassy in The Hague, Netherlands, covering the energy, environment, science, technology, and health portfolios. Diplomat Hardaway led the embassy's energy outreach to various government entities, such as the Dutch government, Dutch companies, and advanced the U.S.-Dutch cooperation on climate change and water management. She also managed closed door donor coordination on mutual global health and environmental programs. However, Diplomat Hardaway's first foreign service assignment was as a consular officer at the U.S. Consulate in Monterey, Mexico. She adjudicated U.S. visas for visitors wishing to visit or work in the United States and provided services to U.S. citizens living in Mexico, such as passport services and emergency services. Diplomat Hardaway is a native of Atlanta, Georgia, and an alumna of Atlanta Public Schools. So Matt Hardaway holds a master's in public administration as well as a master's in international relations from Syracuse University. She received her Bachelor of Arts in Economics from Emory University. So Matt Hardaway is dedicated to community service and is a huge champion of diversity and inclusion initiatives in foreign affairs, serving on the boards of the Pickering and Wrangell Fellows Association and Thursday Network Greater Washington Urban League and as a member of the International Career Advancement Program, ICAP Fellowship Alumni Association. Welcome to Matt Hardaway. Are you excited to be with us here today? I'm super excited. Thank you for inviting me um, to speak. Thank you so much for joining us today. Next, I would like to introduce you to our distinguished diplomat, Erica Lewis. So Matt Lewis joined the U.S. Department of State as a Foreign Service Officer in 2009 and currently serves as a Political Economic Unit Chief at the U.S. Embassy in Lesotho. Prior to this assignment, she served as an African Union Multilateral Affairs Officer at the State Department headquarters in Washington, D.C., and completed a six-month economic studies course and follow-on detailed assignments. 
Diplomat Lewis's other State Department headquarters assignments included serving as the Iraq coordinator in the Near Eastern Affairs Bureau Office of Assistance Coordination and the Caribbean coordinator in the Office of Foreign Assistance. Her overseas assignments include work in the consular and political sections at the U.S. Embassy in Cameroon and as a consular officer in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. Prior to joining the Foreign Service, Diplomat Lewis completed internships at the U.S. embassies in Ecuador, Sierra Leone, and with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in the office of retired Congressman Charles B. Rangel himself, wow, and at Merrill Lynch & Co. Diplomat Lewis graduated with a master's in public policy analysis from Pepperdine University and has a bachelor's degree in international business with a concentration in African studies from Howard University. Diplomat Lewis is from Chicago, Illinois and is married with three children. Welcome Diplomat Lewis. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us today. Finally, but certainly not least, I would like to introduce you to distinguished diplomat Aquania Escarne. Diplomat Escarne is currently serving in the Office of Allowances as a deputy of the section. She joined the Foreign Service in January of 2008. Prior to that, she served as an intern in Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor Bureau in the summer of 2005, and as intern for the U.S. Embassy Quito in the summer of 2006. Her first tour was in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, where she served as a consular officer and assisted in the evacuation of Americans and their family members following the earthquake in 2010. Her second tour was in NEA SCAEX as an assignments officer. She staffed NEA and SCA specialist positions and helped with the return of family members and American staff during the Arab Spring when six posts were evacuated over a short span of time. Her third tour was at the US consulate in Dubai, where she served as the supervisory GSO from 2012 to 2015. Her most recent tours have been in Washington DC in the Bureau of Human Resources as a recruiter and an interim deputy of outreach and recruitment and as a Columbia desk officer in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs. Diplomat Escarne has a Bachelor of Arts from the George Washington University and a Master of Arts from John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. In 2003, she was the recipient of the Thomas R. Pickering Fellowship. Welcome, Diplomat Escarne. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. So let's get started. The question that all of our members, 500 plus of them have been, well, 80% of the 500 have been asking about is what is, what is the life, the day in the life of a diplomat actually looks like? So I'm actually gonna go, um, we'll start with Diplomat Hardaway first to share with us, what is your foreign service officer journey? What inspired you to join? Uh, what experiences that you use in order to make your application competitive in order to get accepted into the service? And finally, why do you continue serving the United States in this capacity? Well, we'll start with the first one. Tell us about your FSO journey, Diplomat Hardaway. Sure, um, so I joined, um, the, well, I was a Wrangell Fellow um, actually, um, and I applied right after undergrad. So I studied economics. Um, I spent my entire life in Atlanta. I wanted to work in a bank or do something very normal. Um, but I was graduating during the financial crisis. It's the height of the financial crisis in 2009. So none of the banks were open. Um, I saw some of my, my classmates who had like top bank jobs. Um, those jobs were being pulled away. Um, so I had just come back from studying abroad. I was in uh, London for a semester and I just explored different things. Um, there was a, a federal career panel, I was, in, I was at Emory, um, and they are what are called diplomats in residence who sit at different college campuses across the country. Um, so the diplomat in residence who covers the Southeast region um, sits at Spelman College. Um, there's one in the DC Metro area who, who sits at Howard. Um, so the diplomat in residence came over to my school, who did a presentation. He was this African-American 
a gentleman from Georgia, from the small town in Georgia. Um, and I was just fascinated by his career. I didn't, I didn't know um, the State Department existed. <laughs> I didn't know a diplomatic career existed. Um, and he encouraged me to take the Foreign Service Officer Test and apply for the fellowship, um, which I did. I, I didn't have any expectations at all, um, but I ended up getting the Rango Fellowship um, which sent me to grad school um, and, I, and I took the Foreign Service Officer Test. Um, so that's my journey, um, why I continue to do this. I think it's some of the most fascinating work, even, even on days where I'm like frustrated. Um, it's, it's, it's really interesting work. Um, and I am motivated to continue to represent um, diversity, um, even here in an African country um, I do not see hardly any women um, in the, the sector, the, the, the portfolio I work on, which is business, banking, economics. I hardly meet women. Um, so even today, there's um, a great um, underrepresentation of women of color um, in this sector. So that's, that's what motivates me. Um, and then what I do um, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, my, my main job um, is to promote the economic, commercial, um, and environmental uh, policies of the United States and Cameroon. I spend most of that meeting with companies to promote U.S. commercial interests. Um, today, I met with uh, representatives from the African Development Bank to explore uh, mutual areas of cooperation. So they do, so they finance a lot of infrastructure projects um, across Africa uh, and other development projects. Um, tomorrow I'm meeting with a US company to talk about um, introducing his services and products to the Cameroonian market. Um, I also work on environmental issues, which um, I can get to uh, later, but that's also considered an economic portfolio um, at the State Department, we have what's called the E-Family. So that includes environment. Um, so I work on wild uh, initiatives to combat wildlife trafficking, now climate change. Um, COVID-19 health is also considered an economic portfolio at State Department. So I update um, and report on the COVID-19 um, updates here in Cameroon. Um, so that's like a day-to-day -day of what I do. Uh, so yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Diplomat Lewis, what, why did you choose this career? So for me in high school, I did Model United Nations. Um, and as a part of that experience, we did some of the larger kind of conferences in our state. I remember going down to University of Illinois, being from Chicago and just really enjoying that experience. And um, my first kind of big model UN conference I represented, uh, I was the delegate from Sierra Leone. And so I was looking at opportunities to do more of it. And I came across this summer program. Um, I believe it was called uh, National Student Leadership Conference. I convinced my parents to pay for me to go do this for a week in DC um, and kind of explore the international diplomacy career track. And as part of that program, we visited the State Department. So it was my first exposure to the State Department I said, wow, it was almost like my eyes were open to this field that I knew nothing about. Um, so at that time, pretty much from my sophomore year in high school, I knew this is what I was what I wanted to do. Um, and I even remember on graduation day, um, kind of in the remarks saying, yes, I want to be a future Foreign Service officer. Um, so very narrowly focused. Um, I attended Howard because the month that I applied to like 11 schools for undergrad, ended up getting into eight, but like the month when I was making a decision, um, I got an, an, a magazine from Howard and on the front was a Rhodes Scholar, a black Rhodes Scholar who um, talked about how she had interned in an embassy and it just looked like she was doing foreign service related things. And I said, okay, Howard is the choice. Um, so, once I um, started at Howard, literally my first semester, I took Pan-Africanism. And that was my first time taking a course that was focused on Africa, the African continent. 
Um, there wasn't really any discussion about, you know, Africa aside from just maybe glazing over it in kind of my whole academic career up to that point. Um, so I fell in love at that point with the African continent. Um, so yes, I was an international business major, but even as you mentioned in my, um, in, in um, my bio, I chose to change my concentration from a business focused concentration to focus on African studies. So I love Africa. Um, I haven't looked back. Um, I love business economics, uh, which is one of the reasons why I chose the economic cone. Uh, development is something that's very interesting to me. I at one point thought that if I did anything else, it might just be via USAID, civil servant or foreign service officer. I love development work. Um, and so, yeah, I'm grateful to be here um, right now in Maseru Lesotho uh, serving um, and covering economic affairs is one of the things I get to do. Um, so in terms of day in the life, I don't know if you want me to hold on that or can I go ahead and, and share at this point? You can hold on that because you want to hear Diplomat Ascarni's journey. Because I, I'm hearing a common theme that you guys got exposed really early on, which is one of the things that I, I really love that Ambassador Bonnie expanded WCAPs include. We have a program called Genzers, and that's really focusing on high school initially, but I think it's also expanded to middle schoolers now too, because it's so important for us to get that initial um, insight and see what that field looks like, rather going into college, majoring into something, working for a couple of years and realizing, oh wait, I actually wanna be an FSO, but what is that exactly? What's, how do I put the name to that? Um, so I wanna hear your journey, Diplomatis Scarnet. How did you become a foreign service officer? So mine is very different, but similar in that I discovered my passion for travel first. And I was in the seventh grade. I raised money. I sold candy to my classmates to raise money for the school trip to Spain. And it was my first time that I could remember being out of the country. My mom swears I went as a child, but I don't remember. And I came home and was like, mom, I want to live and work abroad for the rest of my life. At the time, my mom was super supportive because she was like, you're in seventh grade. Who knows what you're going to do in your life? But I actually did pursue the path. I only applied to schools that had international affairs programs when I was a senior in high school. And that led me to George Washington University, where I went for undergrad. Now, I will be honest, before college, I assumed I would be an international attorney. I had even picked out the law firm where I was going to work in D.C., called Steptoe and Johnson, because my mom used to work with a lot of attorneys. And that's all I knew. So when I heard that, you, you know, I was asking around about jobs that you can do where you live and work abroad, the attorneys were like, you can be an international attorney. So um, I went to school, studied political science with the intention of being a lawyer. And my sophomore year, um, I was in my second year of college. I was still working two jobs to help pay for GW and a full-time student. And I came across the Pickering Fellowship. It was one of several scholarships I applied to. And I just really was doing it for the money because I really wanted to not have to work so much to go to school. But I was very blessed in that they called me up, sent me to the interview process and called me up and said I was a recipient. And that's when I was able to learn even more about other ways to join the foreign service to serve abroad um, in college exposed me to the State Department specifically because um, the fellowship I wouldn't have known about if it hadn't been for one of my friends who was a summer clerical for the State Department and worked with a Pickering Fellow. So that's why I learned about the fellowship and that's why I applied. And after that, um, the internships that were offered is what solidified it for me. So I was actually able to um, study in Ecuador econ work and also um, domestic, in the US, I did an internship at the Democracy, Human Rights and Labor Bureau. So I also got to do human rights work, which is what I was focusing on in undergrad as well. And so that is what really solidified the career for me and um, gave me that really that confidence to know this is what I want to do and the rest is history so that's how I got in that's how I learned about it um, can't wait to share my day in my life but I love what I'm doing um, and I love the ability to travel live abroad and to help people 
So actually, let's go ahead and talk about the day in the life. Um, you know, I heard a, a lot of recurring themes in terms of the exposure to it, you know, at a, a very young age, but then the pathways sound a little bit different. So before you, you get into your each day in the lives, maybe share your, your pathway. Like what was that step that looks like? Cause I know some of the questions that we got in some of our other sessions was that, you know, folks were saying, hey, I, I majored in something that's not necessarily international relations. Can I still do this? Or um, we've had folks that are artists, but they, they know they want to go back and serve. So they're trying to find that link between being an artist and then, you know, serving as a representative for the United States as an FSO. And so can you, the point Oscar, you can actually start this off. Um, I know you, you talked about the fellowship program. Do you want to highlight that a little bit more? Are there any other fellowship programs that yes. some of our um, participants can consider? What does that step look like? Is it after college, before college, you need work experience? Absolutely. So as a former recruiter, I can definitely speak to all of the recruitment opportunities. So the first thing is um, it depends on where you are in life, which one you pursue. When I got the Pickering Fellowship, I was an undergrad student. And at that time, we did recruit undergrad students and pay for some of undergrad studies. The program for Pickering specifically has now changed to where they really only recruit those who want to go to graduate school, but you have to apply prior to graduate school, okay? The goal is to give you that additional degree so you can apply that to your experience and then also um, your qualifications. But uh, the Payne, Donald Payne Fellowship, which specifically is uh, focused on development work. So if you wanna do international development, you would do the Donald Payne Fellowship. The Charles Rangel Fellowship is for those who may be interested in Capitol Hill and foreign policy issues because they have an internship on the Hill. And then the Thomas R. Pickering Fellowship is primarily for those interested in the foreign service as well, but they wanna do an internship at the State Department. All three fellowships, if you are fortunate enough to be a recipient of the programs, you will get uh, some of the money towards your graduate expenses covered, which is very helpful since graduate school can be quite expensive. And now they'll cover education, some of your living expenses as well. And we have partnerships with some of the universities, depending on where you go, that the, the difference or whatever you don't have, if you do have a balance, may be covered by the school that you attend because they want to support fellows as much as possible. It's a win-win for the schools and for the students. But all three fellowships are geared to help people of color, minorities, diverse candidates from the United States get that exposure into the foreign service before they actually go into the career and make school affordable. So there is a two-sided prong to that. Um, but I think it's a great way to get into the door and to see what the life is like before you sign the contract, right? And you get sworn in. But the other thing to keep in mind is that they are very competitive programs. And so I highly encourage you, if you're interested, to apply for all of them. Um, they do a really good job at de-conflicting applications. So if you are a strong competitor for Wrangle or for Pickering, um, they will talk amongst themselves and then give you an offer for only one. So you don't have to worry about, you know, missing out. They'll make sure that the best candidates move forward in the right process. But that's a little bit more about those programs. They do apply once a year. Um, we've dropped the links to the programs in the chat box. If you want to read more about the programs, they're named after distinguished honorable individuals who have contributed significantly to the foreign service and have really set a trailblaze of, you know, a trail that is amazing. Like Thomas R. Pickering has been a multiple ambassador and Charles Rangel and others are just as successful. So we're really proud to be members of these organizations. But in addition to being a part of those fellowships, you get network, you get opportunity to ask questions again, prior to being in the foreign service. But if you don't get the fellowships, it's okay. I still encourage applicants to pursue the traditional routes for entry, which we all have to do those too. So 
please know if you do a fellowship, you will still have to meet the regular entry requirements for the Department of State. And that means more work. So <laughs> just keep in mind um, that that's kind of part of the deal, right? But they pay for your school. You sign up for five years of service. If you don't get the fellowship, you can still take the foreign service exam, which is a written exam offered uh, three times a year. You can still um, do the oral exam and the interview process, which you'll get invited to only after you pass the written exam. And everyone now has six essay questions that they will be asked to answer in the middle of the process, which is also another um, avenue to weed out applicants. So really encourage you to have strong writing skills, keep up to date on foreign affairs. Um, there are some study groups across the US, especially in the DC area, if you're local, that are constantly meeting to prepare for the written exam, but there's also a free guide now that you can use to get an idea of study questions. And last but not least, there is a foreign service or a Department of State app. It is not limited to the foreign service. The app is called DOS Careers, and it is on the app store for Android and for Apple. The app not only gives you more insight into foreign service and civil service positions, but it also has old test questions that you can take to kind of see, are you savvy on foreign policy or other questions that might be covered on the foreign service exam. But I wanna just kind of emphasize that even though we're focusing today on foreign service officers, we do have a very strong, bright and essential civil service uh, employees who are our institutional memory. They are subject matter experts who have also the ability to travel at times and to go deeper into their expertise. And we also like for you to consider those opportunities if you decide you'd rather be permanently placed in the US and occasionally travel abroad. But our civil service employees are just as important as our foreign service team. Thank you so much, Lamas Garnier. I'm taking notes. I'm like, okay, we definitely know the diplomat that we're going to reach out to when we're drafting this publication, especially as it pertains to the recruitment. Um, you answered all of the questions regarding that. Um, we had several questions on each of the different type of fellowships. So I appreciate you taking the time to go through all three and giving some insights um, and then providing so many resources because a part of this publication, we're going to add um, several links to resources to that as well too, so that we can have an all comprehensive toolkit for, um, for women of color in particular that's seeking to enter into the foreign service. So, so thank you for sharing some of those. We'll make sure that we incorporate that. And again, like I mentioned earlier before, at the end of these, this series, we're gonna reach out to all of our speakers that you guys can be a part of this publication, however you see fit. Maybe it's just looking at a couple of sections, maybe it's adding some insights um, to it. And so you guys will definitely be a part of that process as much as, like, as, much as you would like or as little as you would like as well too. So um, thank you so much, Diplomatist Garnier, for that insight. So with that, um, let's turn over into the day in the life. So I know Diplomat Lewis, you were eager to get us started on that. So I would like for you to introduce the cone that you're currently representing today and walk us through what does that cone mean and what does your day to day look like? Thank you. So I am an economic coned officer um, and the day in the life. And this is one thing I think that Christina mentioned that's really one of the things that I really enjoy about the Foreign Service is that you constantly have things that are changing. Um, one, one advantage is you're, you can constantly work on something different. No two days look the same, essentially. Um, so I can give you a sense of some of what I work on and then DC versus being overseas in the economic cone. Um, but just highlighting that this does not at all um, capture what is the full vein of what it might look like to be an economic cone officer overseas or domestically, because it just will completely depend on that job, who's in leadership at the time, um, who, you know, who, where the top issues may be for the day. Um, so right now, of course, I'm political economic chief, so I'm kind of wearing two hats. But then that being said, political and economic work, you have a lot of intersections, particularly when it comes to issues like trafficking in persons, um, labor issues in general, um, there's a lot of intersection between political and economic work. Um, so for instance, today on the economic side, I reviewed our country commercial guide. This is something that is put out 
by um, all of our missions overseas, um, usually by foreign commercial service. But in this case, uh, we do not have a foreign commercial service um, presence here in Lesotho. So more or less, we are the liaisons as the economic officers for commercial issues in country. Um, so reviewing that to see what we're going to put out, what, what information we're going to provide to try to help U.S. companies who may want to enter um, the Lesotho market to have more information. Um, also, I met with the senior vice president of a U.S. company that's working here in Lesotho that's been having some challenges to try to then go back to my ambassador. We sat down this afternoon to strategize, okay, what message do we want to deliver to the prime minister to try to get through in terms of, you know, emphasizing that we really want to make sure that the uh, road is paved a bit easier for this U.S. company um, and how it's tied to potentially other benefit programs that Lesotho may um, desire to enjoy. Um, also, I sat down and strategized with our senior leadership team regarding an important health issue. Again, something that Christina highlighted, health is huge and it's been huge for me, not, over, not only overseas, but domestically in the econ jobs that I've had um, or jobs that have touched on econ issues um, because there's a difficult health issue right now that's going on in Lesotho. Certainly can't provide any details, but that took up a lot of my day today um, as we're looking to see how we're going to strategize and message around this um, issue over the next week or so. Um, domestically, though, I would note that you could say in general, maybe as an econ officer domestically, you might be at the 30,000 foot level, whereas here on the ground in country, I'm focused in terms of meeting individually with US companies and individual health issues and dealing with the specifics of the country commercial guy. But that being said, just given the kind of range of assignments I have, I don't feel that that's always true. So on one side, um, domestically, I've worked as a program officer and you can say that that's kind of interfunctional again, kind of touching on political and economic work. Um, but as a program officer, I've gotten into more granularity and detail than maybe even my officers would be getting into overseas. Um, particularly, I was a program officer for Iraq. And so I knew the intricacies of programs that we were funding there. I could, you know, in particular, Mosul Dam was a big program um, that I, I, I helped to manage that um, award that we had to another US government agency to try to basically fortify the dam um, to prevent it from sinking long-term and potentially failing. So I could speak to you about the intricacies of, of uh, making sure that a dam had the correct um, amount of grout in the foundation to keep it from failing, whereas the economic officer in Iraq wouldn't necessarily know those details. So as a program officer, you are able to kind of dig deeper, even though I was based in DC. At the same time, when I served as the African Union desk officer, um, I focused more at the 30,000 foot um, level. So the African continental free trade area, how are we gonna increase US company um, engagement and interest in this award, and, or I'm sorry, in this agreement and looking at that globally. Also African centers for disease control and prevention. What are we gonna do to try to help to um, increase our uh, cooperation with Africa CDC on a wide range of issues, including earlier in the pandemic, um, the response and, and efforts um, that they were pursuing there. So at that, I'll stop. So basically each day can be very different. I wouldn't necessarily say that DC is less granular than overseas. It just depends on the type of role. Thank you so much. Um, and I know Diplomat Hardaway, you're also an economic officer as well too. So can, can you share with us, what does your day look like? What are some differences since Diplomat Lewis has, um, she's wearing two hats, a political and econ role. Can you give us an overview of what your day looks like and maybe some of the distinctions? Yeah, I do. I do some of the same things um, as Erica. So I'm, I have to review the country commercial guide as well. Um, and just to give you more kind of insight on that, um, the, the Department of Commerce also has diplomats. They're foreign commercial offices, um, but particularly in Africa, there aren't that many foreign commercial offices. I think there are like five on the continent. So when there isn't a Department of Commerce um, officer, the State Department econ officer takes up the commercial work. So I have to review the commercial country commercial guide. Um, we try to update that on an annual basis. Um, I'm going to meet with U.S. companies. Um, I'm working on COVID-19 issues as well. Um, we're in a transition period, so I'm also acting chief. So I, I also have to cover 
um, some of the political issues, which is very important here um, for, uh, in, in a country like Cameroon, maybe Lesotho as well. Um, the political dynamics definitely have an impact on how you do economic work and commercial work. You can't ignore that at all. Um, when I was in DC, I, I covered, um, I was in a regional bureau called the Economic Regional Affairs Office. Um, Erica was just in that office um, covering the African Union desk. Um, and I covered gender and entrepreneurship, which was a mix of like political, econ, public affairs work sometimes because I had to deal with um, exchange programs dealing with uh, women entrepreneurs. Um, I would say the difference is that you, unless you are like on a country desk, um, you don't become as an expert on one country. You're looking at things from a regional point of view or from a broader point of view. Um, I also manage grant programs. So I, so I do have a little bit more knowledge of how a grant, the process of a grant more so than a, a typical reporting officer. Um, so yeah, it just depends on what you're working on in DC. Also in DC, you don't, um, meet as much with external US government people, um, where it, where in overseas, particularly as a reporting officer. And when I say reporting officer, I mean a political or economic officer. Um, contact work is your, your bread and butter. Um, that's like you have to meet and go out and talk to people, which is, is a lot difficult in during the, the pandemic. Well, we're still trying to figure that out, but you do have to go out and meet people. Whereas in DC, um, you're, covering more of like the internal US government um, perspective of it. Thank you so much for sharing, the, especially giving us the distinctions both you and Matt Lewis um, shared about, you know, what does it look like to if you're working in DC versus if you're not in DC, which is a, another question that um, we received in our last session in terms of, can I get that same you know, experience if I just wanted to stay home or if I want to go abroad, do I lose anything from not working in DC? So thank you for providing the insight to that as well too. Um, to Matt Escarne, so you're representing the management cone today. So we would love to hear from you. What does a day in the life look like for the management yeah. cone? So I'll be glad to present both sides of the pond too. That's what we sometimes say. Um, I, I am domestic right now. I'm in Washington, DC. And as such, there's always, always jobs available if you ever want to come back to Washington. Now, whether or not they're the ones you want to do is all about timing. Uh, in Washington, think of management officers as the fixers and the logistics people. We make things happen behind the scenes and we rarely get full credit, right? Because we are literally behind the scenes. And the ambassador or your office director or some of your colleagues are the front facing individuals. And you sometimes are the one who is keeping the train moving um, while everyone else gets to be the public face. With that said, when I'm in DC, I can do anything from and I have done these specifically. So I can help people find jobs abroad, actually coordinating the selection of our top candidates to serve overseas in our posts, where everyone comes to you to apply, to express interest, to interview, to ask questions, to connect them to the overseas mission. And then you coordinate with the overseas mission to pick the top best diverse candidates for the positions that they're recruiting for. I have also been the person to facilitate the return of family members and officers in the event of evacuation, not once, but three, four, five times now. Um, because when someone is evacuated from Port-au-Prince, Haiti after an earthquake or a six post after the Arab Spring, they are sent back to Washington temporarily and sometimes you need to keep them busy, right? So you give you find work for them to do to contribute to the department's mission while they're unable to do their original jobs overseas. So walking around the building, having networks and contacts, asking who needs helpers, who need space, who has space for these people to work out of their offices and allowing those who are evacuated to also adjust, um, get their expenses covered, ask questions if their children need to get into local schools, all these things that come into doing our job. We're not just here, you know, um, and have the resources sometimes to do everything on our own. So you go to your management officer or a 
per point of contact who's chosen to help you facilitate that transition, even if it's temporary. And the same thing is applied overseas. When you're overseas, the management officer facilitates your transition to post. We look for your housing, so we're house hunters. We're contract signers, making sure tax dollars are paid, uh, spent responsibly. Um, we're also in charge of the shipment of your personal effects so that when you do move into your home, it looks like home and making sure your stuff actually gets to you and not lost at sea. We're also in charge of the VIP July 4th parties, sometimes everything from the planning to the contracting to the location. And we have relationships with hotel contacts so we can negotiate again, the best prices for US taxpayers. So we do a lot of the logistics that makes that, that smooth transition for the people who work in the embassy um, or the consulate. A lot of times I like to tell people, you know, I, my customers are government employees, but they're also American citizens um, because if we have an evacuation like we did for a lot of places in COVID, the planes don't just show up. Uh, consular officers might help create the list of who needs to get out. Management officers will actually coordinate the plane landing on the ground and making sure it has seats, it has food, it has a like a process on where to check in, how to, how much luggage can you have? Um, how much are the plane tickets gonna cost? I did all of that last year in COVID to help facilitate American citizens returning back to the US. So it is always a different day for me. It is very similar to um, you have a wish list and then you have fires and you will decide in your day which to pursue at any point, depending on who is screaming at you first. But I love what I do because it's never boring. You're always helping someone. And I am the person that every day I get to say, how am I gonna say yes? Because I try not to be difficult, as long as it is not in violation of the law, I will try to make it happen. And if it is in violation of the law, I get to be the teacher who explains to someone else why the Americans can't just do this or fly in Black Hawk helicopters because this American citizen got arrested or why you can't live in a mansion because you believe you should. <laughs> but then other people like, hey, we have a big family. We have 10 kids and we all want them to come with us to Zimbabwe. How does this work? And in that management officer at that post, uh, this is a real thing that happened before, rented out an old school and everyone had the space they needed for their family to enjoy themselves but also to have accommodations for a family of 14. So it all just depends on what's going on, what you're gonna do. But I promise you, you will always be entertained. You will always be challenged to do more. And, um, and you're helping people. You're helping the people who work for the government. You're helping people outside of the government. It's always something. And you do get to have some outside contact but most of your customers and the people you work with are inside the building. Wow, that sounds amazing. Um, we, this is more than we can read on the State Department website. So again, thank you so much, Matt Ascarni, for writing those insights. Uh, some of the questions that we receive from some of our um, mid-level to senior career um, members of WCAPs who may not have been in national security, but they're looking again to transfer their skills from their past profession into a management role. Um, and so I, th I think there's a couple of them that's here in today's session. So hopefully hearing you speak, they can start to find a place or home in the management cone. So speaking on finding a home, um, many of our participants and our members in WCAPs are actually working on their applications right now. And so they're trying to figure out, you know, what are some of the keywords or buzzwords? Uh, maybe there's a certain position that I need to highlight more than others on my resume to show that I am hyper interested or hyper qualified for a particular cone. Um, and we'll start with you, Diplomat Ascarne. Um, just one advice that you have, you know, as folks are working on their application, if they're interested in the management cone, um, 
what can they do in their application? Is there a buzzword or sentence or a particular role or experience that they should be pulling from in the past? I'll turn it over to you. And then we'll go over to Diplomat Lewis and followed by Diplomat Hardaway to share one tip on how they can you know, boost their applications. Well, I will say the fact that you apply and you want to be a management officer is definitely going to be a step in the right direction. We are the one of the officer career tracks that's in demand and it's consular management tend to be the um, most sought because there is not as much knowledge about what we do. So the popularity is not the same as our political econ um, officer. So the fact that you express interest in management will actually help you at least get to the interview stage because the percentage of those who pass the foreign service test who are then asked to do the essay questions is higher for management and consular officers. So I'm mean, not saying this for you to say you want to be a management officer and you actually don't because you do need to have the resume and the passion to back this up but it is a great start. It'll help you, at least from a numbers game, we do have more management applicants that will be led to the essay portion of the test and then eventually the interviews just to keep that applicant pool as uh, numerous as possible. But in addition to that, um, any management supervisory contracting travel experience you can get before you join is great but travel experience is not required and neither is language. Um, most people assume that because we're foreign service officers, you have to come in with a language, but that's not true. We will train you in any language that you need to do your job. We will also train you to be a management officer. So you do not have to specifically know what I do as a management officer in the foreign service, but if you have the skill sets required, it'll distinguish you as well. So supervisory is always great. Budget or fiscal experience is always great. Um, the ability to manage teams, the ability to work under pressure, the ability to uh, think outside of the box and solve problems. Mind you, if you go to careers.state.gov, you'll actually see the 13 dimensions that we look for in all officers. And I just named about half of them. Working under pressure, quantitative and qualitative skills, um, and the ability to build teams, a cultural um, diversity or being able to adapt, cultural adaptability, those are other skills. So even if you haven't traveled far or even abroad, if you can show experience in being able to bring together different cultures in the United States, in your community, in your college, in your small town, that's great experience to highlight as well. How can you make us a better foreign service? Highlight any of the positive attributes you have and the skills that will distinguish you from every other applicant. Um, and keeping in mind that we are looking for diversity. So geographical diversity, um, is, is nice to have educational diversity, diversity in interests, background, or even experiences are some of the things that are now distinguishing candidates from others. Thank you so much for that. Um, one of our questions, we already have about five questions lined up so far, and we're still halfway through. Um, one of the questions actually ties into quantitative analysis. They're interested in econ, and they're taken aback by that. They're like, I don't have any experience in this area. And so I'll turn over into our two econ officers um, to give us a tip on, you know, if I'm interested in the economic cone, what can I do in my, what is, where there's my resume, maybe it's my essays um, to show that this is the place that I should be assigned. So I'll start with Diplomat Lewis and then turn over to Diplomat Hardaway. Um, I kind of just want to co-sign on something that um, Aquania said in terms of just focusing on the 13 dimensions. Like I say, careers.state.gov, go there, spend time there. Um, and in terms of just my preparation, I think that that was important not only for um, the oral exam, which I would absolutely encourage if you get invited to take the oral exam that you really focus on those 13 dimensions. And when you talk about buzzwords, I would use some that are linked to those and think of experiences that you have in each dimension that you can be um, prepared to kind of articulate. Um, but in terms of the FSOT, 
um, because it's so general, it's almost like an SAT. I feel as though, um, you know, looking at a review book, in my case, I think I actually got like a foreign service officer prep book. So some of the free materials that Aquania talked about, um, but I want to say that I got mines from like a Barnes and Nobles or something. There was some sort of foreign service officer prep book that I used to be able to look at just sample questions. Um, so earlier, like in the application phase, I, I'm not sure if focusing on your economic expertise is gonna be as important, except for maybe just being able to highlight it and articulate it when it comes time to take the oral assessment. Again, though, I, we're really blessed to have Aquanita, so she may be able to you know, help to ground truth that, but um, I just wouldn't want anyone to become too focused on that because yes, you do get the training uh, when you get on the job. Um, one thing that I can say, honestly, I wish we did more of, which uh, is training in the foreign service, but you will at least get that basic, you know, economic officer, it's called political economic trade craft. You will be able to get that basic trade craft at the very least before going overseas. And then um, as you move on in the service, you can take advantage of more opportunities like I did to take the economic training, which was a six month intensive, you know, classroom environment where I had economic training. And I touched, we touched on everything from, you know, quantitative analysis to country data analysis, et cetera, just to be able to help me to strengthen um, my economic expertise here. So uh, with that, definitely turn it over to Christina. Yeah, I will strongly um, echo Aquania and Erica that um, for the entry exam, the Foreign Service Officer Test is the 13 dimensions that, you, that they are judging you on. So go look those up, um, digest them, remember them. That's what you're being um, judged on. Now, in terms of when you get in um, and to kind of address the question about like how comfortable you have to be with quantitative analysis um, to be an economic officer, um, the, the key skills um, that you need to be a reporting officer, and I'm going to say reporting officer because a lot of times economic and political work is interchangeable. It's just the subject that changes. Um, you need strong writing skills. Um, you, like I said, you need to be able to, to keep up contacts, meet with people. Um, and you need to be able to take like um, a, a large amount of information, whether it's quantitative or just like a whole bunch of social media posts and turn it into a story to report back to someone who knows nothing about your country. Um, so with that being said, with economic work, sometimes it is, people get scared of it because like I said, you might go talk to a bank. I, like I've worked on foreign exchange issues in Central Africa. Um, you might have to like look at debt figures. And this is the same class I took with Erica, this six month class um, where we were trained by like PhD economists to kind of really dig into this more. Um, that can be intimidating, but your value is not you being able to like um, make, do a calculus problem with these things. It's being able to digest that information and being able to report it back, tell a story. Um, most of my bosses are not econ officers, they're political officers, and they do not, they, they don't have an affinity <laughs> for economic work, although they appreciate it. They, they, um, don't have a grasp of it a lot of times. And sometimes, and most of the time what I'm doing, I'm not regurgitating like statistical figures to them. I'm just explaining to them in plain words, what's going on. So we'll get into that question that one of our, our participants have, because it's so related to what you guys just talked about, especially for our econ officers. Um, you know, she shares that she loves environmental issues and she wants to work in this field, but she's a little hesitant to become an econ officer because She's okay with quantitative analysis. So can you offer any insights, again, to Matt Lewis, Matt Hardaway, you know, about working outside of the development or finance aspect of economics, or is the economic cone limited to just development and finance? Should I start? So for State Department, this is, this is a joke, but I'm actually serious. Economic work is anything that's not political. <laughs> So it's environment, it's business, it's health, it's technology, it's science, it's, it's really anything that doesn't fit neatly into that political box, in my opinion. Um, so in the Netherlands, I worked on energy, environment, science, technology, health. That was the econ portfolio. So like I said, your, your job will, will certainly change um, 
the, the, the details of your job will change from post to post, um, unless you um, stay in like the exact same region in the same position, which you shouldn't because it limits your promotion ability. Um, the actual topic that you recover will change. What, what stays common in terms of reporting work is your ability to digest complex information, um, write it up in a, a way that people who have no idea about your country or your topic can understand it um, and make those contacts on the ground and, and really be the eyes and ears on the ground um, for the US government. So that what stays consistent. So, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the science issues I work on, um, particularly with climate change and like measuring emissions and all that stuff, I, I do not, I am not an expert on that but I have to be able to take what, what the experts are telling me and tell someone else who doesn't know about, who doesn't know a lot about the topic, like what that means. Do you want to add anything to Matt Lewis? Is there anything else that, you know, if I'm interested in economic cone, is it just limited to economics and quantitative? I think that's the biggest thing that's scaring her off. Is there anything no, else? In no, the Nothing to add. I think Christina hit the nail on the head. Like it can be a whole range of things and it doesn't just stop at, you know, environment, science, technology, health. It can, it can touch on so many things and there's so much overlap um, between issues. At some post, the labor officer is the econ officer. At some post is the political officer. Like, you know, so it just, it, it really does um, just depend and it can be very broad. So I would say, do not be intimidated at all. I know some really great econ officers who do not have a great econ background and did not take the six month intense course that I did either. They're still able to do a great job. Uh, communication is one of the most important things in our job and also writing skills. So honestly, at the end of the day, if you can communicate effectively um, and, and are able to write and communicate in writing, I guess, and verbally, those are the two most important things in my view. Thank you for sharing. So Matt Lewis, so we're now at the time that everyone's been waiting for. It's the mess to bunk. We have so many questions about, um, do I need to know language? Which the Matt Escarne told us straight up, like you don't need to know language, we can teach you some of those skills. You don't need to have experience traveling prior to coming into the foreign service. Um, and so one that I wanna start with, and then we'll go over to you to Matt Lewis to give for you to give us your top five myths that you've heard about the Foreign Service, and we want to take opportunity today to debunk those, um, is that, you know, we've been hearing a lot from the other diplomats that it doesn't matter what you, which cone you select, everyone has to go through the consular cone. Is that true? Yes, as far as I know, that is still the case. I know that there are, um, some discussions being had about potentially creating mid-level entry uh, opportunities where I don't think you would have to do that. But as far as I know, that's that's still the case. I, I want to kind of, right, I see a pretty, um shaking, nodding her head. So I, I think that that is still the case. You do have to go through consular. So we'll turn it over to you. What are some other myths that you've heard about entering the foreign service or gaining a life of a foreign service officer? that you would like to debunk today? I just have three and they'll be um, pretty brief. The first one is that if you join the foreign service, you have to spend the rest of your life or your rest of your career working life overseas. Um, that is not true. I can say that as someone who just spent six years in Washington. This is my first overseas assignment in six years. Um, and quite frankly, I left after six years because we had a 6-8 rule and that's just recently been amended as well. So there's also additional flexibilities that are now built into the Foreign Service if you needed to stay domestic for a longer period of time for family or other concerns um, that might be going on. Um, so I just think that that's really important to highlight someone who was an informal mentor to me in the Foreign Service. She spoke about how in the 1960s, she was um, covering as an economic officer in a Latin American country and watching African-Americans be hosed down in the streets 
um, in the US. And at that point she decided I need to be back in the US. And so she chose to spend the next decade in the US. And I think about her experience and her choice to, hey, I feel it's more important for me to be stateside because of her desire to be connected to what was going on during the civil rights movement. Um, and my personal desire to stay domestic to support my husband's career advancement and him kind of pursuing his passion um, professionally as well as my own is something that's very doable. So, you know, if you have a spouse who doesn't necessarily want to spend the rest of their lives overseas, um, know that it's very much a career where I feel that the department is doing more and more, I feel every year to try to help accommodate various situations relating to family, elder care, life situations. Um, so that's the first myth. Um, the second one kind of tied in with that, so I'll skip it. And then the third one is kind of just thinking that, you know, there's this lone wolf foreign service officer who's going out and I'm gonna single-handedly, you know, solve all the issues um, that the government of Lesotho um, is facing and, you know, more or less anything in political economic space, I'll be able to do it. The thing um, that I wanna debunk there is nothing that I've done in my foreign service career, with the exception of maybe writing my performance appraisals or just some minor things day to day have I done alone. This is all about working as a team. And you heard even in my day in the life as someone who is considered a part of the country team as the political economic chief, it's all about strategizing and discussing together to try to solve problems. Um, so at the end of the day, some of the greatest accomplishments that you hear um, about from individual foreign service officers, just understanding that those were probably very much influenced by teams that were working behind the scenes, um, people in various cones working together, um, your locally employed staff providing the expertise and feedback and helping you get access to the individuals that you need to in, in a certain country. Um, so just understanding that this is very much um, a, a career, I think, for collaboration to be able to advance US foreign policy. Thank you so much, Matt Lewis. And I've I've been volunteering all of my speakers. I had your name down next to mentors and sponsorships because you gave us so many great insights um, into you know the importance of having mentors and what what sponsorship can potentially look like in the workplace as well too, especially when you talk about you know this is a team oriented field and what that looks like in a day in their life. So thank you so much for sharing that insight. Um, one of the the myths that you know, that's similar to, to one of the ones that you just debunked was about whether or not I want to become a foreign service officer, but I don't want to leave the United States. Is that an option? I'm happy to answer that. No. <laughs> so we are foreign service officers. So you are expected to serve overseas. Um, that is the primary reason you applied and they, why they hired you. So we technically have worldwide availability. But that is also a myth that we can debunk today. There are some people who come in and they're not worldwide able to travel. And that could be for family or medical reasons. But it is expected that you try your best to serve abroad as much as possible within whatever makes sense for you and your career. So what I mean by that is um, someone comes in, they're worldwide available when they get hired but say your health changes within your career, and now you can only go to certain countries where they have good medical care. You're still worldwide available, but you may only go to your Londons and Sydneys and not to um, smaller countries where the medical care or development situation is not the same, right? So keep in mind that we change. Our children, our spouses, their health may be what impacts where we serve. So we do our best to find a place for everyone. And I'll actually say, most people assume, here's another myth, that there are not enough people to go to Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq. And I'm here to tell you there are plenty of people who wanna go there. And then there are plenty of people who don't wanna go to Paris and don't wanna go to Spain. And so we have enough places where people do want to go, right? Because we have people who want to go to Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, and Somalia, or and, and Sudan. And we have people who are willing to go 
to Paris and to Toronto and, you know, wherever it is that might be a little nicer. Um, but nice is perspective, right? There are some people who like living. I loved Haiti. That was one of my favorite tours, but everyone assumed because it was Haiti, it must not be that amazing. I found blue water oceans and really untapped beaches because no one was really going out of their way to be a tourist in Haiti. So there are gems everywhere and you just have to figure out what is your thing. Do you want to serve in small posts on a specific issue that affects several countries? Do you want to have a language specialty and you just go to China speaking posts or um, Spanish speaking posts? You get to decide your niche. Okay. We are generalists, which means in general, we should be able to be trained to do whatever the government requires. We serve at the pleasure of the government, but you can get as deep into a region, a language, or a topic as you want. Um, after your first two assignments, you literally choose where you go and you're interviewing where you wanna go. So the world is your oyster and you can decide if you wanna be abroad or if you wanna be in Washington. And if you wanna be in Washington, what issues do you wanna work on? If you don't wanna be in Washington, do you wanna be in New York? Do you wanna be in Atlanta? Do you wanna be in Florida? We also have offices across the US that work on certain issues. Most of the work is done in Washington, DC, but we do have those who report to the UN mission in New York. Um, we have diplomats and residents who are on college campuses across the US. Um, we have an office for foreign missions that helps consulates or embassies of other countries with issues they may have in the United States. And those are also offices across the US. So we are not limited to Washington, D.C. If you do come back to the United States and you do have the opportunity to pick your niche, your section, your language, your topics that you love. So that's really good. I can go into my other three. What was it? Three? Or yes, the okay. We would love for you to go into your other, other niche that we need to debunk. Yes. OK, so um, the other one is. If I come in as a management officer, will I only be able to do management work? No, I am a management officer, but I've been in the government for 13 years and I have done all the career tracks. I have been an econ officer, political officer, uh, consular officer, a, um, what else? Yeah, all of them, all of them. And I will say the main thing that has allowed me to be able to do all of the career tracks is my reputation for being a good officer. So no matter what you do, you should do your job well. And that reputation is what will help you navigate into spaces that you may not have all of the experience for, but you have the passion to learn and you have the mentors and sponsors in the decision rooms that are going to recommend you for the job. And I will say uh, in some cases, I did leverage my mentorships and sponsors to help encourage decision makers to choose me. In other cases, I just was myself. I got one job that I was never considering applying for because I spoke to a group of officers in my recruitment capacity, right, to tell them about things that they should say when they're recruiting. And there was an office director in the audience who was taken by my presence and my public speaking skills and was like, I think you should be a Columbia desk officer. I wasn't even thinking about a reporting job and I definitely hadn't applied to that opportunity. But once she met me, she encouraged me to apply. I asked more questions. I got to know the team and I got the job and I had no political experience prior to that assignment. So do your job, do it well, be you. And a lot of opportunities may come to you. And so that's another thing people don't realize. And I have been able to go from that desk job back to management with no difficulty because that boss in that job still highly recommended me for a management job because they saw how I was able to apply my management and logistics skills to properly manage the taskers that come with being a reporting officer who constantly has oh, you have to write these talking points for the secretary and you have to write this paper for the trip. And I was able to manage it all, right? 
Um, and so transferable skills are also very helpful. And a lot of us have them because we are generalists and we are expected to be able to fill in wherever there's a need. Um, I'll do a family one because I didn't hear anyone mention family yet, but I do have two small kids and a husband in the private sector. You can be a successful foreign service officer with a partner who is in the private sector. You just need to do a little bit more coordinate, coordinating and you may spend more time in Washington. And that's exactly my story. My husband is the breadwinner between the two of us and he works for a big consulting firm. And he is the person who probably will become a partner. So what we've been able to do is coordinate his sabbaticals or overseas tours with my career by starting a year in advance and really trying to match up what I have with what he has. And then he has to do his work to still lobby and get the other foreign service firm or the overseas firm, excuse me, to hire him. But we did it. We did three years together in Dubai. And when I was in Haiti, he wasn't able to come to Haiti because they didn't have an office there, but he did work from home before that was a thing. Um, and we would um, go back and forth between Haiti, Florida and DC meetups. So it, sometimes you will be separated from your family. Sometimes you'll be with them. It is up to you to communicate and coordinate that your relationship stays strong. Um, and that's something that you'll be doing ongoing if you choose to come into the foreign service and have a partner um, or children, right? Um, so that's something to think about. And you can be with someone who doesn't work for the government, although we have a lot of officers who will marry other officers and they will do what we call tandem assignments. Those are two people in the government trying to get assignments in the same country or the same post. And I said country because in some cases, one person will work at a consulate and one person will work at the embassy if your positions are too close to be in the same space or you are both the same type of officer, then obviously you can't have the same job, right? So sometimes we will have families who work in the same country, but not at the same mission. Um, so that's the few that I kind of want to put out there. Uh, creativity rocks. If you can be flexible and create creative, you'll be very successful in the foreign service. We always are adapting to change and nothing stays the same. Thank you so much, Mastarni, for providing so many great insights. And we actually get a lot of questions about work-life balance and family. Like, can I travel with my family? Should I do this before I have a family and kids? Um, you know, how's the dating scene in F for Foreign Service Officers? So we've gotten these questions in the past before. We have one of those um, tonight. So we'll share that um, after Diplomat Hardaway gives us her top five myths that she would like to debunk. Yeah, so I came up with a few. Um, so one thing that I always get asked about or people assume is that you need an IR degree or graduate degree um, to be a foreign service officer. And you don't. Um, you don't even need a college degree <laughs> to, to qualify to be a foreign service officer. And as um, Erica and Alfania have said over and over, you, it's really on the job training in terms of the specific portfolio you work on, but there are kind of skills that are interchangeable um, as you go from assignment to assignment and even job to job. So Aquania kind of touched on being flexible, that we're journalists, um, being able to communicate, being able to work under pressure. So those are the skills you need, but, but you don't need a, like a specific IR degree or even a graduate degree um, to get those skills. Um, I also uh, hear people who kind of like want to like have a, a plan to be an ambassador. Um, and you don't necessarily come in, you, you shouldn't come in planning to be an ambassador. You should come in planning to enjoy your career and doing things that interest you. And out of that, um, you, get, you may get to a level um, where, you know, someone will think, will say, oh, th that would be a good ambassador or a good um, director for this topic because they've done such a good job for it. So, the goal is to enjoy what you do and do a good job. Um, but in terms of like a, a narrow career path, that's not the case in the foreign service. You might come in and, th and think you wanna do one thing and then you discover something else and you wanna concentrate on that. Um, I will also say that the foreign service has become a lot more flexible even since I joined and I haven't been in 
um, as long as, as others, but um, there are more options to, to, to not even serve in DC, to serve in other cities in the United States, to serve all over the world, to do um, different jobs, to, to learn different languages. And so once you get in and, and your first two tours are directed, you can kind of get a feel of what that will be for you. But I always um, remind people to be flexible and open um, and not limit yourself to what your idea of is like this path to becoming an ambassador. So those are my, my myths debunked. Thank you. Those are some really great insights. And so we'll get to some of these questions that we have. Um, and since to put my Ascarni brought up, you know, family, we'll bring up that first question. But if this is a, a, a not complex, but her perspective is really coming from an age perspective. She wants to know, you know, should she start her family first or should she probably wait on starting a family before she enters into the foreign service? Um, are there any priorities that she should put in place first before getting to foreign service or can she just join and then she can figure it out as she goes? So if I ask her, I'll turn it over to you since she's, you sort of kind of answered this, but if you want to add additional insights um, for our participant, I'll sure. turn it over to you. To so I do want to say one thing. My name is pronounced Aquania. Um, just putting it out there. I, I should have corrected it earlier, but I just was gonna just keep going. But anyway, um, yes, family, I think that's a personal choice. I think you need to decide for yourself, what is it that you want to focus on? If you have the circumstances that you want in place to start your family, by all means, do not wait on the foreign service to do so. Because for one thing, our application process can take up to a year and a half but because you can only take the written exam once a year if you pass it the first time you still have to do the essay questions and then you might get invited to the interview and then there's a possibility you don't pass one of those phases and you're you have to start all over and if you are going to wait on us to hire you before you start your life Ooh, you got bigger problems. So focus on you. What do you want? What is the best for you? If you have the support system you need to have your family now, start your family. We have people who start with young kids. We have people who start with high school students. Um, we have people who come in single. That is a personal choice. Um, I will say, as someone who found my partner in college, I was very, very communicative on what I was doing because I literally met my husband the day before the Pickering Fellowship called me and our first date was to celebrate the fellowship. I was in a good position where I could talk about what I applied to, what was the requirement and what did that mean? Most people find it difficult to bring these topics up because who on a first date wants to know this person's leaving in a few years and oh by the way living abroad and um you may or may not want to do that with her but I had the opportunity to present it and my husband clearly liked it the idea and was receptive because he proposed but for some people they will find it difficult to find a partner and overseas, the dating pool may or may not be what they want. It depends on where you serve. I've had friends who have married um, on their after their first tour, and we have a lot of people who do that. And then I've had other friends, Black intelligent women, who have said, I got to go back to D.C. to find my spouse um, and have intentionally returned back to D.C. to find a partner in addition to coming back to be with their family or Reacclimating to life in the US while their parents are elderly and aging. There are many reasons on why you will make these decisions. And I, I want to keep in mind that although we are foreign service officers and overseas, it seems like our job is the most important thing that we're doing, but we are still human beings too. And we have love lives and children issues and family issues and things we need to take care of. And so it's important to remember self-care, you know, um, and, and living a life that you can be proud of. So if that means you stay overseas for a few years, you come back to the U.S. every other year, or you stay out for 15, 20 years and you serve in developing countries where you're helping people the way you want to, that's up to you. Um, but 
we do our best as an agency to help families stay together, but it will be difficult times where you will have to make choices. And you can always choose not to go to the places where your family can't go. That's an option too. And we've had some people who made those decisions. Thank you so much, Madis Scarney. So I know you mentioned, you answered this question in the chat box for us already, but I know there's a couple of folks who will watch this later that will have that same question. But what is a 6-8 that was mentioned earlier? Can you tell us what that is? Uh, yes, it just really, it's, it used to be a rule that when you came back, you could do up to six years in the United States, and then you would need a approval to stay an additional two up to eight. Now that rule has been eliminated in that you can stay eight years without any approval. However, we can't do beyond eight years because the Foreign Service Act actually says we're in the Foreign Service, we need to be living and serving abroad. And so we can't pass the eight year mark because then we wouldn't be foreign. So um, just something to keep in mind. And, and honestly, I don't think, and if anyone is joining the foreign service with the expectation that they're gonna go to one country and then spend the rest of their career in DC, it might not be the best time for you to pursue this career. Um, that rule is there to, to, to allow the flexibility that some of us need to be back home when we need to be. Um, but there are also other benefits to working in Washington, including networking and the ability to secure those more senior positions that will allow you to eventually become an ambassador. And I guess that's one myth. We're not all ambassadors when we first start. Um, a lot of family members think that, but ambassador is actually a rank and title that's designated to either those who are appointed by the president or those who are more senior in their career and they have been selected and nominated by the president on uh, as recommended by the State Department. So just kind of clarifying, um, but we all are here to represent the US when we're abroad. Thank you so much for that. And speaking of abroad, I know Diplomat Lewis and Diplomat Hardware are actually abroad right now. So I thank you so much for hanging with us still. It's probably about midnight or 1 a.m. Eastern Standard Time in your time zone. Um, one question that we had from our participants was, what are some of the challenges of working abroad? So I, I'll turn this over to either to Matt Lewis or to Matt Hardaway to answer that question for us. Uh, some of the challenges of working abroad. Well, um, you do have to balance your, your personal life, um, particularly if, if you have a family that isn't coming with you, you have to balance keeping connections with them. Um, technology has come a long way since I first joined. So there's, there's FaceTime, there's WhatsApp, all these other things. But even as you mentioned, the time zone difference, you have to manage that. And sometimes you can feel like you're missing out on um, important milestones um, when you're overseas. And then of course, um, I mean, we all are judged based on our cultural adaptability, but like each country has like something different about it that you have to get used to. Some countries take longer. Um, like one thing that I didn't, that was unexpected for me about Cameroon was how traditional and conservative gender roles are. So even when I go to certain office, um, certain meetings at certain offices, I, I can't wear pants <laughs> because gender roles here are very still like, you know, women do this, men do this. So. Um, yeah, those are some of the things that have been more challenging for me overseas. Thank you. And Diplomat um, Lewis, um, we had a question. He talked about this earlier about the commercial guide. So our president wants to know what is a country commercial guide? Well, it will be a document that I, I think you can probably, if you Google um, US country commercial guides, you'll see our previous uh, guides that we put together, but it really will just provide US companies or someone in, in, um, hoping to enter a certain market with as much information and as many tools as they can to be able to just make some of those initial decisions. Of course, they can reach out to the embassy to get more in-depth information, um, but that's gonna provide a very solid blueprint, everything from a market overview, it will go into licensing, what documents you need to submit, how long it takes to be able to get a license to operate in X, Y, and Z country. Um, so it can sometimes be as long as 20 pages, but will really provide that overview to help a uh, company 
or an individual understand whether or not this may be a, a country they want to invest in. Um, and just a, one last thing to add in one tidbit on um, something that may be challenging overseas. And I mentioned this earlier, which is why I spent the past six years in DC before coming here. Um, it's really been um, just the, the career thing for a spouse. My spouse also works in the private sector. Uh, gratefully here in Lesotho, he's teleworking with his US company. So I'm sitting in his office now. Um, so again, the world is changing. Um, so I think that that's gonna make it even easier um, for those that are potentially looking at such options. Of course, it's not always easy still, depending on agreements between that host country, um, but it's something that can be explored. Um, so just don't give up. Um, and I would encourage everyone if, you know, if your family is important to you, it's never um, something that I feel that I've had to trade off for my career. Every single tour, we've been able to work together so that it's worked for both of us, whether we've been in DC or whether we've been overseas. So just don't give up and don't be discouraged. And since you are an economic officer uh, with Matt Lewis, we have some economic questions. Like what are the salaries like? Is there a difference if you're working in DC or abroad? So we have, for foreign service officers, we have a rank in person. Um, so depending on where you are kind of in your career trajectory, um, if you know your grade, that is going to be your base salary. And then it just depends on where you are, what's added on top. So there's some jobs in DC that you can have if you're in the, the DMV area, you have a pretty significant locality pay that you'll get just for living in that area that's more expensive. And then maybe you're doing a staff assistant job where you also get a differential on top of that um, because you're doing a job that's going to require you to maybe do more odd hours um, or longer hours in some um, some extents I think you can you know maybe have a 12-hour day there or something um, and overseas you have your same base salary so that kind of stays the same regardless of where you're working um, but you may have additional allowances based on where you are. Like you'll have a cost of living allowance. You can have a hardship differential. You can have danger pay. Um, my first tour in what S, we got danger pay after I'd been there for about six months. So that was unexpected, but a pay bump because of changing situation on the ground. So um, I, I kind of stopped there, but it just depends. It all depends. But at the end of the day, as foreign service officers, because you're rank in person, it's going to be where you are. Your base salary is where you start, and then it goes from there. Okay. Thank you so much. And this final question before we have our um, closing question for all of our panelists, I'll turn it over to um, to Matt Hardaway. You talked about customs and culture, and how you know in your country, you know there are certain meetings that you can't arrive in pants in. And as we know, we are all experiencing the pandemic. And so one of our participants today had a question about, you know, can you share how COVID-19 perhaps has impacted, you know, your day-to-day, -day, whether it's, you know, access to vaccines or is there guidelines on your ability to meet people face-to-face, -face, work from home? Can you share a little bit about how COVID-19 has impacted your day-to-day? COVID-19 has been challenging. Um, especially in this part of the world where power goes out almost every day, um, internet can go out. So teleworking is not <laughs> the same um, as it is in DC where you have access to developed uh, infrastructure, uh, particularly with our local staff. So, you know, I have a generator, but my local staff doesn't, they don't have generators. So if their power is out, it's out. Um, they can't even charge their cell phones at that point. Um, if their internet is out, or if they even have enough internet to hold a hour, two hour virtual meeting, because data is not something that's unlimited here. Um, you have, it's, it's definitely been a challenge managing all that, um, combined with the demands that haven't been less. So they've, it's been the same pace or a, even a faster pace. Um, so we've been doing a hybrid. Um, there are some things here you can't do um, virtually. Um, there's some audiences here you can't meet virtually. So we do practice meeting in persons in a safe way. We, we wear masks. Um, 
if we have an event, which we haven't had many, um, they're capped at a certain number and we make sure it's in a, a big enough space. Um, we're limiting people who actually come inside the embassy. We have things outside. So we have been um, uh, adjusting to the circumstances. In terms of vaccines, I was lucky enough to be able to be vaccinated. Um, so I, 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 you know, I appreciate the State Department um, for, for doing that. Um, and we have also given vaccines to Cameroon. So uh, within the past few weeks, we've given the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine um, to Cameroon and hoping that increases um, the number of people here who are able um, to be vaccinated. Right now, uh, vaccine transmission rates are low. Um, so we're hoping that makes a difference. But in terms of just like working, um, it's, yeah, it's definitely been a challenge. Thank you so much for sharing and to be respectful of everyone's time, especially our two panelists that are um, located abroad. We want to now close our session with our closing question that we've asked all of our panelists across our last three sessions in our FSO 101 series. And that is, why do you still serve? And feel free to incorporate one of your accomplishments as well too. Um, while you answer that question. So Diplomat Ascarnia, we'll start with you first. Why do you still serve? I like what I'm doing, but I will be fully transparent every tour I reevaluate. And I think you should do that in life. So um, once I do an assignment and I learn new skills and meet new people, uh, my husband and I talk about it and whether or not it's still a good move to keep going. And when we agree to keep going, I stay. But I've... Um, had a great opportunity to live in different places, expose my children to the world, but I've also had challenges too. Uh, surviving an earthquake's not easy. The work that comes after it was not easy as well. Um, and I've also had to, like I said, at some points be separated from my spouse, um, but not since then, so that's good. But I encourage you guys to reflect on all of the accomplishments you've done and how you feel about your job. And if you still feel good about it, then you stay. And so that's why I'm still here. Do you wanna share one of your greatest accomplishments so far? Uh, my first tour, you know, getting 16,000 people out of Haiti so they could be reunited with their families and including small minor children who had been left by their parents um, because it was right after a holiday was one of my proudest first achievements. Um, but I've done so much more since then, um, helping our team, um, helping on other evacuations and my colleagues. So even last year, the first set of people evacuated from China when the COVID-19 was diagnosed as a problem, um, we were there on the ground to help them and to help their kids. And so I always appreciate being able to help our own uh, just and give them the resources they need to feel confident, comfortable, and safe. And we've, and I've been doing that for the past two years. Uh, COVID has continued to change my job on a daily basis. Thank you for your service, Matt Ascarna. And thank you again for joining us for today's session on exploring the political, oh, excuse me, exploring the economic and management cone. I'm forecasting into our next session. Uh, Diplomat Lewis, why do you still serve? And feel free to share with us your proudest accomplishment to date. Um, for me, it's it's definitely, I think, influenced by my faith. Um, I'm a person of faith. I spend a lot of time praying about this each and every tour. Um, and it's where I believe I'm still supposed to be. So at this time, this is where I believe I'm supposed to be. If it's not where I'm supposed to be in the next few years, I'll be doing something else. Um, but evaluating often is something I can definitely agree with that I do. Um, in terms of greatest accomplishment, it's uh, probably one more recent that comes to mind. As the AU desk officer, we really did try to do a lot to um, increase it interest and engagement with the African Union. And so um, my team and I, it wasn't just me individually, uh, were able to make a solid case for President Biden's first speech to a foreign audience to be delivered 
to the African Union on the occasion of their annual leaders summit. Um, and I was able to put together the building blocks for those speech. I'm not gonna say I was his speech writer, but I put together the building blocks for those speech and definitely saw a lot of the things uh, underlined and underscored in what he uh, eventually shared. So um, really glad we were able to uh, not only raise the importance of Africa, um, for uh, this administration, but to have it be the first foreign audience that this administration chose to address. Wow, thank you for your service as well too and for joining us for today's series on exploring the economic and management cone. Diplomat Hardaway, why do you serve? And please feel free to share one of your proudest accomplishments to date. I, I serve because I, I find the job interesting. Um, I never have a boring day. Um, I've never had a boring assignment yet. Um, I'm able to reinvent myself, learn something new um, every assignment. Um, and I will also say that I reevaluate every tour. Um, some of my, my accomplishments that I'm more proud of, um, I enjoy connecting people to information that they otherwise would never have gotten. So when I was working on the entrepreneurship and gender portfolio in um, the Africa Bureau, I would organize panels for African women entrepreneurs focused on how to export their products to the United States. So one panel, um, one year we had Whole Foods, we had Walmart, we had these big grocery names who were directly talking to these women about what they're looking for when they source products from Africa all, you know, all the requirements. Um, here in Cameroon, um, we've held information sessions connecting um, Cameroonian uh, organizations, businesses to US partners, to US financing. So one session um, was on our development finance corporation. So as a result of that session, there, there's this Cameroonian solar panel company who was able to reach out, pitch their project, and, and get some interest um, in financing from the United States and also find US partners. So that's most what I enjoy um, being from someone like again, who didn't know about State Department, who didn't know about you know, all these things, um, connecting people to information that they probably otherwise would not have known about. Well, again, thank you so much to our distinguished diplomats for joining the Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security and Conflict Transformation. I would like to thank the, our executive director, Ms. Spencer, for allowing us to continue the series. And a special thanks for our undersecretary, um, Jenkins, for creating this space so that I could bring in some of my passions um, as it relates to diversity in the profession. I myself am Maritza Donis. I'm an international attorney. I have the honor of resolving disputes between countries and corporations fighting over failed investments. Also manage MT Visions, which is a corporate social responsibility and government relations firm in DC. And we have our campaign DI Diplomacy that we've been so excited to work on the last couple of years to really help diplomats um, abroad be more intentional about integrating DI into their practices. And diversity in profession is my personal favorite. I believe that we should be in all these spaces that we don't need to work harder or fight harder um, because we have so many great mentors like Diplomat Ascarne, Diplomat Lewis, Diplomat Hardway um, that's done the hard work. And so I thank them again for taking the time today to share with us some insights and to provide us um, that encouragement that some of us need in order to take that exam the first time or to take it again, um, or maybe that self of, um, I can do it too, because I see someone that looks like me that's currently doing it and doing it well. So again, thank you so much, distinguished diplomats. I will be following up with you to, to provide you with my own personal um, gift of token of appreciation for your time today and sharing next steps if for any of you that might be interested in our publication project that'll launch late fall. Um, but thank you so much again for your time and thank you to all of our participants for joining us as well today. Continue to stay safe, take good care everyone. Um, as it relates to COVID-19, together we'll overcome. Thanks everybody, good night. Thank you.